Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. And a very big thank you for our inspiring panel for traveling here to Colchester to be with us for this important conversation. So we know that all eyes are on the COP26 conference in Glasgow as world leaders come together to find out how we're going to fight the existential crisis we face in climate change. We know that the world is at a crossroads in making the decisions we need to make to act while we still have time to act. And at Essex, we understand that time is running out and it's never been more important for us to do our bit as a university to help to make progress against climate change. That's why in 2020, the University of Essex declared a climate and ecological emergency to reflect our commitment to take the actions that we need to take to make a change, to make a difference before it is too late. We know that uh, science and technology will help us with this, but that we also all need to change our behaviours. We need to think about how we live. We need to think about how we lobby. Uh, we need to think about how we exercise our activism and advocacy. And here at the university, we absolutely recognise the vital role that universities must play in tackling climate and ecological change. Not only through the way in which we lighten our footprint as an organisation uh, with a commitment to achieve net carbon zero by 2035, but also by the way in which through our education and through our research, we're playing a part in being the catalyst to support our students, to be engaged citizens who are contributing uh, to progress and, and putting our research ideas into action uh, to help to reverse the impact before it is too late. Our Essex spirit encourages us to challenge conventional wisdom, to challenge received ideas, to think differently and to be bold. And we're committed to helping to find solutions to one of the biggest threats that the world is facing right now. Our scientists are at the vanguard of tackling climate change just last week, Essex marine biologist, Dr. Michelle Taylor, uh, her work was read out at COP26, urging leaders to help save our oceans before it is too late. And we've also helped to understand how the loss of glaciers enhances the breakdown of complex carbon molecules in rivers. We've led research into how drought stress affects crop yield and explored the demise of sea ice. We want every member of our community to come with us on this journey to learn from each other, to learn from our partners, to learn from our collaborators, to better understand the environmental and sustainability challenges that we take, and crucially, the actions that we can take in order to tackle this. So we're incredibly proud to be partnering today with Global Citizen, and this important event is an opportunity for us all to explore what we need to do to change, to make the change that the world needs, and to learn from our friends and experts who are leading this challenge. So I'm delighted to welcome our inspirational panel today. Michael Sheldrick is co-founder and chief policy and government relations officer at Global Citizen, which is a movement that inspires and empowers millions of people around the world to learn and to take action in support of the most critical issues facing humanity. We're also very pleased to have with us this afternoon the inspirational United Nations IFAD Goodwill Ambassador actress, activist and model Sabrina Elba. Along with her husband Idris, she has joined Global Citizen on their mission to defend the planet and to end global hunger. And finally, we are very, very happy to welcome back to the University of Essex our graduate Kindred Moots, who since studying at Essex has carved out an incredible career working with the United Nations, with the Obama White House, with USAID and many NGOs, including of course Global Citizen to deliver impactful campaigns and communication strategies. Kindred, it is great to have you back, and I know you'll be an inspiration to all of our Essex students this afternoon. We can't wait to hear more about what you've been doing. Thank you. So, um, I'm going to pose some initial questions to the panel, uh, and let me just kick off by saying, uh, we know we're welcoming you here, um, coming directly to us from COP Glasgow, where all the world's eyes have been on an event that many believe is, is our last chance to get this crisis under control. 
So, uh, Michael and Kendred, you've come straight from Glasgow. Um, how was it, and what's your view on the progress that we're making? Well, and I should point out, Sabrina and Idris were there on Saturday as well. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> she was actually up there more recently than us. But um, look, uh, I, I, I think what I've been saying to people over the last week, people keep saying, is it, is it a success or failure? And really, the best way to think about COP and to answer that question is to remember that there's only one fundamental question that is really relevant at the end of all the press release, all of the announcements, and that is, you know, in 2015, all of the world came together and they signed up to the Paris Agreement. And in doing so, they said they, they aimed to keep temperature rises below 2%, 2 degrees, uh, preferably 1.5 degrees. And since then, there's now this consensus that really it has to be 1.5 degrees because anything higher than that is just going to be profoundly detrimental un un and unfair to so many vulnerable communities around the world. And so the question we should ask ourselves coming out of COP is really, where are we at in terms of closing the gap in action needed to keep temperature rises at 1.5 degrees? And at the moment, even if you add up all the announcements, and I know there are various analysis, and I keep on saying I uh, withhold judgment until the end, but even if you look at all the analysis coming out of COP, right, at the best case scenario is 1.8 degrees. Now, if you give that the benefit of the doubt, that is still better than the 2.7 degrees we were hurtling towards just a few months ago. But that 1.8 degrees is loaded with caveats and a lot of buts, right? So, you know, there was a great pledge made around the world reducing its methane gases, but my, my home country of Australia isn't part of it. There was a lot of our uh, coal being fa phased out, but there's only actually 15 countries that have agreed to that, not including many of the leading coal producers. So I feel like we've got these flags in the stand, these milestones, but a lot more is, is mm -hmm. required. And from my point of view, as an advocate who cares about at the end of extreme poverty, you know, and the fact that it's the most vulnerable communities. And in fact, the last trip I did before the pandemic was actually with Sabrina, um, myself, her and Idris went to Sierra Leone and met with some of the farmers on the front lines. We are not keeping our promises to them. And there is a lot of smoke, string and mirrors, but fundamentally, you cannot expect countries, whether it's from Africa, who collectively make up two to three degrees um, as a percentage, sorry, of the world's emissions to come with commitments if we aren't keeping their, our promises mm -hmm. to them. And I think not enough has been made of that fact coming out and we've still got a lot to do. And until we do that, it's very hard to see th there being the level of trust and goodwill required for us collectively to come together and address these issues. That said, you know, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater mm -hmm. and there was a lot of good, good commitments on the margins, a lot of great announcements and speeches as well, but collectively, when we add up to the big picture, we're not where we need to be. Okay, so Sabrina or Kindred, is, is there anything you'd want to add in terms of, of what your views are coming out of the conference? Sabrina first. I, I think, Mick, you make a, and sorry, Kindred, you want to speak on, on that as well, but I think you make a good point that it's important, like you said, I love that expression, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, because um, you know, there's still a bit of time, uh, but the caveats it, are absolutely there and we see them. And, and being on that trip that Mick mentioned, it was quite ironic that we had visited Sierra Leone at the end of a, an Ebola pandemic that they had just come out of um, and them dealing with the sort of consequences of that. And now sort of globally us coming out of a pandemic um, and seeing it only worsen the effects of climate change really because things have just, I mean, you see it even from everything down from PP, PPC equipment or PPS or equipment or whatever, masks and all that, mm -hmm. all the way up to just um, commitments being slowed down, which we've seen from the advocacy side. So I will say the one thing about COP that, that felt great from our side was that it didn't feel so much that we had to align people on the issues that we were bringing to the table. People felt generally aligned. Everyone mm -hmm. was in agreement on what had to be done. Um, where the challenges were, we thought, mm. um, were actually how do we now get those voices to the table who are suffering in the immediacy in the now? So great, we have all these bigger plans. Yeah. These things are in, in traction potentially, they're moving, but there are obviously communities and the communities that we support as Goodwill Ambassadors for EFAD 
who need the support in the moment. They need the support now. They can't wait because crops are being devastated and climate mm -hmm. change is, is having immediate effects on, on everything that they're doing. So, I mean, I guess that, that doesn't really help maybe answer the question, but I think there is some positivity there and it's good to stay hopeful because what I really worry about is if we don't get to that um, degree percentage, do we give up? Mm. No, because what do we do? Throw our grandchildren off the bus then? Obviously, there are generations that are going to look at us at this moment in history asking, well, what did we do? Did we just give up? So I think hope is important, so I'm, I'm holding on to it, and Mick says he's a glass half full guy, so <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's holding Thanks. on well, to it well, as well. And, and I think every percentage, every point of a degree matters, right? Mm. Christina Figueres in her book, The Future We Want, she says, former head of the UNFCCC, she says every, every fraction of a degree matters to a community around the world. So that's why all of these measures a add up. And yeah. every actor as well. I mean, I think that the thing that came out for me from, from COP, there's been a lot of criticism, uh, and I think a lot of it is, is fair, some of it unfair of the presence of, of corporations or businesses. Um, when you look at you know, the gross domestic product or the assets of some of these corporations, companies, businesses, they are larger than nation states. The role and responsibility that they have is massive, and so I actually was heartened to see them show up. And you know, my country, the United States, has not done enough uh, commensurate with what it has inflicted in terms of carbon emissions. Uh, there are unique political realities that the United States faces, and you know, I think it's really important to think about mm. the fact that in the modern world, with such massive wealth and inequality, mm. companies and corporations are in some ways the new nation states and philanthropies are the new embassies. There are responsibilities that they have due to their wealth that, you know, f to give one example, if you're a foundation with $5 billion in operating assets, you are wealthier than a pretty significant percentage of, of countries in this world. So when you have someone like Prime Minister Mia Motley of Barbados going on the stage and mm. letting these governments have it, you know, I think that's incredible. I also think that she should not be having to do that. Uh, and that's a real shame that, that in the absence of global leadership, we are having to turn to the, the people who have been marginalized for so long and have not been represented to actually take a leadership role in, in pushing government leaders to, to address it. And I think it's got to be a joint effort because foundations, corporations have a role to play. And so I, I was glad to see them show up. I think obviously a lot more needs to be done and commitments are not necessarily promises kept. So there needs to be accountability and transparency. But I do think that this was the cop that for me, the global south said collectively, we are not just here to, to, to decorate the room and, and be part of this conversation, but we are actually coming with a list of demands and we want these to be met. Otherwise we are literally going to be underwater. Um, and, I, and I think that's incredible and I think that is how it should have been all along but I'm glad to see that that's how it, it, it's starting to be now. Okay, thank you. Um, Michael, can you, can you tell us a little bit about how Global Citizen came about and how you're tackling the challenges that humanity's facing? Y yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting and it's great being back in a university mm. and actually this vet staff, thank you for having us. Um, you know, I actually got started as a student activist back um, on the other side of the world in, in Perth, Australia. And when we got started, primarily, you know, we just wanted to do good. You know, we were studying and I always felt grateful for the opportunities I had. And, you know, one, one thing we did was we organized a lot of movie nights, quiz nights, uh, sausage sizzles, as we say in Australia, <laughs> and, you know, raised money to build schools mm -hmm. in places close to home, East Timor, Papua New Guinea, sort of in, in the Pacific. But... As we got learned more about the issues, you know, and we, we studied them, we were like, wow, it's going to take a lot of fundraisers to end extreme poverty. And, and that's the point. No amount of charity gala night dinners are going to be enough to end extreme poverty. This is, these are fundamentally systemic issues. And therefore, when you look at the great structural issues of the past, what it's taken to change it, it's, it's been social movements. And so that's what we felt actually we could do a lot more by getting our government and unfortunately Australia as it was then and still is one of the lowest ranked countries in the world in terms of living up to our international obligations around aid but we felt 
you know, this was something we could do by actually mobilizing people to, to support um, and, and get out and engage. And for us, we often say our model is pop meets policy, where we look at how we can mainstream these issues with popular culture. I mean, we all know about these issues, and the fact you're happy to come here for now and listen to us is probably indicative of many, many of where your inclinations are at, but we're like, how do we reach millions of people? How do we mainstream? How do we for not forget the fact that in America alone, only 12% of people at any one point in time are actually talking about climate change? So the first idea was how do we mainstream, and we were fortunate enough early on that Hugh Jackman, um, for whatever reason, took an interest in what we had to do and really got behind us. And then secondly, it was this idea of how do we actually give people a platform to take action? And through one route or another, you know, myself in, in Australia, we, we organized this concert, it was on polio a decade ago. We managed to convince John Legend to fly all the way to Australia. And then from there, that model of pop meets policy was born and we found ourselves just nine months after that on the Great Lawn of Central Park for the, mm -hmm. what was the first Global Citizen Festival. And here we are sort of a decade later, having taken that model um, around the world and including here in the UK, and we've got Ted here from our UK office as well. Um, but that's something we, we thoroughly believe in, is how do we make sure these are conversations that are happening everywhere and not just in, in the echo chamber? And I think one of the things that really spoke to me last week at mm -hmm. COP is, you, you know, the, the reports were true. I mean, we did a lot of lining up in the registration, lots of queuing. Um, and as I was sat there waiting to, to get into the venue, scrolling on the Twitter feed, there was this one activist who was bemoaning the fact, she said, thousands of us have come to COP and we're all here competing for the same small, tiny platform to have our say. And another activist chimed in and said, this is why we need to be building our own platforms. You know, need to be building our platforms both inside and outside of these institutions to engage these conversations. And that, that's what we really tried to do at Global Citizen. You know, rather than having on a network in America, the next season of The Bachelor or another reality TV show, it's been how do we, how do we engage with and how do we use this as a way to engage people in, in, in the issues we care about. So it's a great example, really, of, of the way in which young people can, can take their passion, commitment, dedication, and, and drive to, to be the change they want to see in the world, and to leverage that in to create a global social movement that has the potential to have a real impact on, on these big challenges. I'd be interested to hear from, from each of you, um, thinking about the young people who are with us here at Essex, um, who, who embody the Essex spirit, uh, the commitment, the passion to drive social change and, and to be advocates and activists and impactful. Um, do you have any advice for the younger generation in, in how, to, how to be effective uh, on that journey? I wonder, Kindred, actually, you, you've been on your journey from Essex uh, to, to be the embodiment of that. Is, is there any advice you would give to Essex students today? Sure, yeah, I, I, and uh, I'm really grateful to, to be here as well. Thank you so much. It's really nice to, to be on campus. I didn't know this room existed. It's incredible. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't find it, uh, but uh, better late than never. I think, you know, for me, uh, I, I knew that I wanted to work for international organizations doing international human rights work. I didn't know what that would look like, and I think I, I thought in my mind that I was going to be a researcher, that I was going to write these incredible white papers, and everybody was going to be like, oh my god, this is amazing, no one's ever had these thoughts before, <laughs> uh, and that people read white papers, uh, you know, in, in the, the sort of broader world, um, and then I, I had the good fortune to, to have an internship uh, on campus uh, with the sociology department. Uh, working on economic sociology issues, and then uh, later an internship at Redress, which is a human rights organization in London. And I came in thinking I was going to write policy briefings, and they handed me the the Twitter username and the password, and said, "Can you run our social media?" And you know, I I, I think that was just by virtue of of the time period, how old I was, that they didn't know how to you know didn't necessarily know how to do it, and wanted somebody to to, to take the reins on it. Uh, and then I I quickly realized that it was such a powerful tool to be able to convey all of the things that I wanted to do originally, uh, to be able to use communications to distill 
you know, complex thoughts, concepts in ways that people can understand. I think my advice to you is, is find that, whatever that is for you. Um, everybody has a skill set, an ability to translate something into something that your community, your family, your friends can understand. Um, I feel really, really privileged to, to be here. Um, my parents and my grandparents never went to university. And you know, it was always really important to me to take things that are happening in academia and the policy sector and make them applicable to people who don't have the opportunity to be in these rooms. Uh, I think that's, that's really important from an equity standpoint. Um, but just you know, get stuck in wherever you are. I think that uh, it was an important lesson for me to be adaptable, <laughs> to be uh, willing to just take the opportunities you're given. Um, I think that, you know, from what I know of, of Sabrina's background and of Mick's background, uh, I, I know that they've had their own experiences where uh, maybe somebody counted you out for the thing you wanted to do, but there was a little window, there was a little opening, and you take it. Um, I think that's, that's something that I would, I would recommend. And, you know, understand that you can have uh, incredible power in your own communities. You know, you may not have access to the rooms that you want, uh, yet, but you have access to the rooms that you're in, and I think use those to be a voice and an advocate for the people who are not in that room, and do everything you can to make sure that they're in there eventually. Um, I think that's 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 one piece of advice I can give. The other is just don't forget where you've been. Um, I think that it's your story is what makes you unique. It's what gives you power. It, if it's ever been used to count you out, take that and use it to to eventually have people count you in, because I think it's what it, it's what really gives you your narrative and gives you that fire in your belly to show up and do the work when mm. things are not as fun or they're not as glamorous or you're, you know, you're in the back room of, uh, of some nonprofit and, you know, figuring out how you're going to pay for your greater Abellio Anglia uh, <laughs> ticket back to <laughs> campus because, uh, you know, I, I know what that feels like. So I think just uh, take, take what you can. Don't ever, don't ever be afraid to ask for what you need. This university network is incredible. People will help you. Um, I'm always around to, to have a chat, uh, whether it's via Zoom, Skype, uh, whatever. I think ask for what you need and, uh, and don't be afraid to do that because, uh, because we have power in community. Thank you, Kindred. Great advice. Sabrina, is there anything you would want to, to say to, to our students uh, by way of advice about uh, being impactful in the world? Um, I think it was so beautifully said. Um, thank you for saying that. I, it's so nice to be at a university because you know everyone here values education and I think that's just so refreshing. It's been a while since I've been on a campus. So uh, I think the only thing that I would add um, and maybe just as I've seen in my, in my personal journey, um, uh, alongside the fact that I was saying to Mick earlier, I actually think it's young people who are really paving the way and educating older generations on actually what to do and, what, and what's right, not just how to use a social media. <laughs> feeds. So um, in, in my personal journey, I think, you know, there was a time potentially where people were kind of like, and, and even now, to be honest, well, why are you using your voice for this? Or wh why do you feel like you have to speak up? Who are you to speak up? I always found that so frustrating because I think the most important thing we have in life is our voice. Mm. And for anyone to tell you that it's not meant to be heard or doesn't need to be heard or doesn't matter is just so counterintuitive to everything that needs to happen in the world. Uh, people will solve the problem. Mm -hmm. It's going to be people in the end. We need solutions based on people. So I think just to always use your voice and to remember the value of it um, in whatever medium that is, whether it be social media or just forums and conversations that you have amongst friends and family, to always speak for what you believe in and create safe sp spaces for other people to speak up because I also find it frustrating that opinions get shot down so quickly Education, as I said at the beginning of this, is so important. So if you think someone has a differing view, to speak to them as to why that is and have healthy conversation and engage. Um, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and Mick, if you were uh, giving undergraduate you uh, a piece of advice, <laughs> having been on your journey, is there, is there something that you think is, is, is a lesson that you could share? Yeah, I, I would say um, s similar to what Kindred was saying about his example of rocking in expecting to write a white paper and then being given the keys to a uh, Twitter channel, which now would be like the keys to the <laughs> kingdom. I'm not sure if they would do that anymore, but there's yeah. maybe perhaps trust in. But, you know, when I got started, you know, we, we were out trying to figure out our very first campaign. 
we had decided that we would focus on the issue of polio eradication. And that was partly because we felt if we started launching a campaign on poverty, people would think that's too vague. How can you possibly address it? There's so many elements. And you know, we were speaking with local Rotary clubs and they told us about this disease and they said it's almost eradicated. It could be the second human disease in history. And um, you know, I, I would say two things. Firstly, it was like, great, how do we go out and actually engage and put it on this agenda? And the then Prime Minister of Australia, Julia Gillard, was hosting what was to be the last meeting of the Queen in, in Australia, and they brought all these world leaders, David Cameron was there and so on. And we, we, I think sometimes it's like, don't be afraid of the audacity of your ideas. Someone said, well, why don't you, why don't you put, why don't you try and convince Julia Gillard to put this issue of polio on the agenda? And sometimes we tend to think our leaders, um, at least I did, you, you t we tend to think they're smarter than what they are. We think we trust them or we <laughs> think actually, actually they all know what's going on. As I've learned over the years, no one actually knows what's going on and there can be an opportunity. In that chaos, you can actually create an opportunity. And someone said, I don't think they will have an idea for this big summit and it's likely to just be a talk fest and they're probably open. And so I wrote this letter, more just to structure my own thoughts, addressed to Julia Gillard, sent it off, and um, didn't expect to hear back. And, you know, I went around the school, meeting with local MPs, members of parliament, you know, I was that guy that would corner them and they'd be looking over their shoulder. Is my staffer gonna come and help me out this one, get this guy away from me? And, and I basically got them to commit. I said, you know, someone should give me a call back on this, because this is important. And one day I got this call from a blocked number and they said, the Prime Minister's gonna be in Perth next week. Um, she's making this announcement, how would you like 15 minutes to meet with her? So go in, meet with her. Um, you know, I'm really, really nervous. I've practiced, I've rehearsed, I've rehearsed my pitch to my parents. Why should she care about this issue? And um, she sits me down and she's a remarkable woman. And I first start by saying, thank you for taking the time. And she goes, um, well, Michael, I'll be honest, I'm on my third shot of Red Bull for the <laughs> evening. If you please get down and tell me about it. So I tell her and she just looked me in the eye the whole time. She didn't interrupt, she gave me a complete respect. It was really almost unsettling because I was like, here I was 22 um, with the most powerful person in the country. And halfway through, she stopped me and she said, I very much like your idea, but I need some help. And what she was in effect saying is, you know, at the end of the day, we can't always blame the politicians because we have to give them permission to spend what is in the end our money. And I just thought, she asking for a public moment and just all I could think about in that moment was what about if we did this concert? And uh, I just blurted it out, if we did this concert. And she said, sure, if you can do that, we've got a deal, we'll deliver. So I walked out there and then I had this sickening feeling because the only event I had organized up until that point, I was the president of some social club on campus, had organized this barbecue. And <laughs> other than some students come along, seeing 50 frozen sausages on the barbecue and promptly walked away, I didn't have much to go on. But what I realized is, um, and this was, if one of the lessons was that audacity of ideas, um, don't think those in power know what's going on because they don't know what yeah. necessarily is. The second idea lesson was just, if you have clarity of idea, uh, a precision of thought, a clarity of an idea, in this case, we honestly felt if we delivered, she would deliver and put this on the agenda. And if you can articulate that, it doesn't matter if you don't know how to do these things. It doesn't matter if you know how to run social media accounts. It doesn't matter if you don't know how to um, organize um, concerts. If you just put that out there and ask, you know, people will be inspired by that and suddenly, out of nowhere, we had a whole army of people willing to help, and in six months, we pulled it all together, and then we found her ourselves on the margins making this announcement. And there I was saying to Julia Gillard, when she made this announcement in front of the Queen and others, I said, wow, you know, who would have thought? We made a deal, and you actually delivered. And she put her hand on my shoulder as if to say, oh, you're so cute. And then she went her way, we went our way, and then, you know, I thought that would be it. And then from there, People are like, you know, this model of this idea of pop meets policy, you know, this could actually be expanded around the world. And mm -hmm. I honestly felt that that was just going to be my one contribution. I would finish my degree. And then here we are uh, a year later. 
But I think, you know, I think back to all those people and I say, why did you come out? Why did you support us? And they said, you know, it was those stories. And one of the producers said, you know, I had all these offers for a lot of money to produce events. And she was like, you weren't offering us anything. She rang me and she said, you don't even have enough to, and she said, have you got, um, what dollars have you got in a door? I was like, ah, oh, the, the local takeout down here has <laughs> offered us free food for all the stuff. Okay, no money. What artists have you got? Uh, these local bands over here, they said they might come, but have they signed? Okay, you don't have any artists. She saw through everything. What team have you got? Wait a sec, is that just your volunteers from university? But she, she rang me back and she goes, you don't even have enough money to pay me. I was like, no, not really, but you can fundraise for your own job as part of it. But she said, you know, it was that idea that we might actually change something that got her in, engaged. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that expression, the audacity of ideas. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very powerful driver uh, to, to encourage us and, and recognizing that, that leadership sometimes isn't about having all the answers. Uh, it's about having the audacity to, to ask the questions and to pursue and to, to keep pushing. Um, Sabrina, you were named United Nations Goodwill Ambassador for the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Could you tell us a little bit about that role and, and what you hope to achieve? <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, I didn't, it's funny, I, somebody told me like five years ago that I'd be working with small holder farmers in the global south. I, I really wouldn't have thought that. I mean, agriculture wasn't something that stood out immediately to me as a, as a particularly important issue in not only the climate crisis, but in gender and poverty. Um, I wouldn't have understood because there was a complexity to it that I didn't really catch on to until I actually went on that trip that um, Mick is referring to. Uh, but yeah, so the International Fund for Agricultural Development helps support smallholder farmers in rural areas as a means to fight poverty um, and to also reduce gender inequality. Uh, and it's very effective because, and one of the reasons that I was actually so happy to be able to support something like this is they don't look at it from an AIDS lens. They look at it from an investment lens. Mm. They're actually giving people the capability to support themselves. And I thought that that was, w when I was on that trip, and sorry, I'm getting really excited because I'm just remembering, mm. seeing the faces on those farmers, those were some of the hardest working people I've ever met. And I hate that there's such a misconception sometimes in rural areas and impoverished areas that these people need a handout, they don't. Mm. They're looking for a means to work. And to be able to support some of that really gets me out of the bed every morning and, and makes me passionate about the work I do. Um, and actually, my mom, I am a Somali Canadian, first generation, but my mom grew up in a rural community in Somalia. And she really said to me early on, because I'd actually been connected uh, to EFAD through somebody that knew her. She was like, this is so important. <laughs> Go, call them right now. Like, you don't understand. Do your research. And even now, I'm still learning about the connectivity mm. and of all the different issues. You can't talk about racial inequality if you don't talk about agriculture mm. anymore. Mm. You can't talk about food systems and food scarcity if you don't talk about agriculture. And learning that these smallholder farmers are actually part of the solution and not the problem because it's so different from big agro. Mm -hmm. I mean, these people work in supporting biodiversity through nature-based solutions long before it was a buzzword. Um, and we spoke briefly, I mean, on the journey here about how important indigenous communities are uh, and learning from them, seeing the way that they work because they are the custodians of this earth. Uh, and IFAD really does a great job in supporting them. So yeah, it's a bit it's a bit more complicated because I think energy, you know, has made such massive movements and in, in mm -hmm. people really get it now. But I think agriculture is probably like 20 years behind what energy is now. People mm -hmm. are just starting to catch on. And it was refreshing to see it caught that people understood the importance of it. So it mm -hmm. felt really good to speak up for something that everyone was rallying around. And just thinking about, you know, you've talked about the connections between agriculture, hunger, um, poverty, and climate change. And you touched also, I think, on, on gender equality. Is there anything that, that you'd, you'd say about how you see gender inequality and progress towards greater gender equity being part of the, the set of issues we need to tackle on climate change? Yeah, well, <laughs> women always get the shitty end of the stick. <laughs> Sorry to use that word. But even learning that a lot of these informal markets and a lot of these rural areas are made up mostly of women who have to have a means to support their family. And even the farmers we visited on that trip were mostly women. 
um, you know, who are fighting social stigmas and, and barriers in terms of getting loans and cultivating land and, and all these things. And generally, women kind of are always in sort of the bottom barrel, make up the most impoverished. Um, so I think it, people are really starting to see that the, the issues are inseparable. I think if you support mm -hmm. women and you support young girls, you really, the old world is your oyster. So much can come about in the immediacy after that. Um, because women really take care of their families, are shown to give back more, um, and really paved the way when it comes to uh, advocating for change in their communities. So, I mean, that's nice to be a part of as an African woman, because I'm like, yeah, I could have told you that <laughs> years ago. <laughs> um, but it, it's just nice to see, and you could probably speak more to that because you were on that trip with me, um, but you really can't separate the issues. Mm. You've reminded me of my, my grandmother who was... Uh, her father died when she, uh, sorry, her husband died when she had uh, 14 children, Irish family, young children. And she used to say um, when she was encouraging the girls to continue in education and, and people would, would say, don't you need them to go out and work? And she would say, when you educate a girl, you educate a family. Mm -hmm. and, and there's something very powerful uh, about the support that you're giving to, to tackle uh, issues for, for, for women and girls in, in the broader systemic effect that that, that then has. Um, Kindred, I wanted to come back to you. Um, you've, you've told us about getting the keys to the Twitter account <laughs> um, and, and the work that you've done in harnessing the power of social media mm. uh, to be an engine for, for social change. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how you, how you leverage that power, how, how you get the good out of social media? Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think the, the thing that really I learned through through my work and over time was that um, I think there's I think there's a perspective from people who don't work with communications or don't uh, have the communications infrastructure or haven't been part of that world that um, that you're just sort of a generalist right that you don't know much about anything you just tell you push a message out into the world that somebody else created in my experience the communications teams at the organizations I've worked with have been some of the most informed people, some of the you know the most eloquent on an issue because they have to know a little bit about everything, or a deep dive on particular subjects. You know, so if we're preparing talking points or briefs or writing op eds, it's a chance to do all the things that I think I thought I wanted to do originally, right? As a researcher, because I do research, and and then I also just get to put it out into the world. I think the. Um, the conversation about intersectionality is so important to me, and it's actually why I want, uh, ended up starting my own company to consult with a number of organizations because one issue just didn't feel like enough because I kept running into these realizations when I would study about gender-based violence for, a, for um, a position, or I would do uh, communications and social media work and advocacy on criminal justice reform or immigration reform or climate change. I started realizing that they are completely connected to each other and that changing one is impossible unless you see it as a holistic part of a much bigger problem. And I think that you know the things that, um, that Sabrina and Mick were, were talking about are uh, amazing examples of that. You know, when you look at something like gender-based violence, the pandemic and the fact that millions of women were at home, you saw an immediate spike in gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. The care economy, there's a loss of, of productivity, of hours, of well-being, of mental health. When you look at vaccine equity, um, women will m walk miles and miles uh, to, to make sure their children have access to a vaccination, even if it means that they don't get one themselves. When you look at the, uh, the people who are pushing for intellectual property waivers or access to vaccinations, uh, that is, you know, th those are people who don't have access to uh, to capital, and many of them are, are women-led movements and communities. If you invest in renewable transitions, most of those are led by women in the global south who are creating renewable economies where they want to harness the power of the sun, where they want to have sustainable uh, development through, through farming and agriculture. I, I begin to see it all as completely connected. And, and when you do that, when that happens, you realize that your advocacy has to be intersectional. You have to bring in the voices of all of these system actors and all of these experts. And to me, I saw value in being able to work with various clients, you know, whether it was USAID or Global Citizen uh, or IMAC, finding ways to, to, to take what I'm learning about each of those sectors and use it to inform 
another client advocacy to say, you know, hey, you're, you're talking about a sustainable recovery for the climate, but have you thought about gender equity? Mm -hmm. Have you thought about uh, the, the care economy? Have you thought about the ways in which, you know, if we don't think about biodiversity uh, and, and forests, then, you know, it, there's gonna be a downstream effect on agriculture and farmers. There, there are those connections, and to me, that's where social media has been so valuable. I think it's very, um, it's interesting to me to see the difference after 10 years in the, in the space where I think 10 years ago, people were too sunny about social media. They thought that it was just, you know, this amazing thing that was going to solve all our problems and change the world. I think the exact opposite now. I think people are overly pessimistic about it. I think the reality is that like anything else that we create, it is as good or as bad as we make it. And mm -hmm. to blame it on companies, to blame it on corporations, to blame it on creators, that is again absolving us of our responsibility to, to use the product in a way that puts the responsibility back on them and says, you know what, we're gonna opt out of that. We're gonna demand that you change this. Mm -hmm. We're going to lobby. We're going to make sure that we're asking for the things that we were doing when we were part of you know, the Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street or Ferguson or Black Lives Matter or Fridays for Future. That to me is where our responsibility lies. And I think my philosophy around social media is that if we take it as a given that we live in the world that, we, that exists, not the world we want, we have to make it the world we want. And to, to not be involved in that platform means you're giving it up to the people who want to make it worse, who don't want to change. And I refuse to, I refuse to cede that ground. And so I think that's where communications can be really, really invaluable. Thank you. And we're going to move into some quick fire questions uh, to to round off the conversation. And I think maybe just a quick fire from me first, which is my last question. Um, talking about these issues is really important. Education and understanding is important, but we know it's also time for action. And, and I wanted to ask each of you uh, if there was one thing that you were to ask us to prioritize as an action that we can take, uh, what, what would you suggest we do? Uh, Right, Mike, since Sabrina, you, would you, you like to go you first? You go. Uh, I mean, uh, what comes to mind instantly is just to speak up, because um, we've touched on that briefly. Um, but yeah, just to use your voice, uh, because again, I th really do think that that's one of the most important things that you can do. And and go to organizations like Global Citizen, and I won't speak too much about it, because I'm probably <laughs> your answer, but um, organizations that allow people to champion change through means that don't just involve financial commitments because I get asked a lot, I don't have any money to support, how can I help? I think there are things that you can do and Global Citizen has done a really great job of laying those things out. Mike, what would you suggest? I, I, I would just make two quick points. One is, is on this point Kindred was going down on intersectionality and I think it's important to remember we, we can't fight every battle at the same time because if we do that we're not going to make any progress on anything, but when when the rubber hits the road and there is a battle being fought, I think we can, a, as a community, actually help get more wins, more progress, if we all rally together. And I think one of the heartening things ar around the COP last week was seeing all of these diverse groups come together. Some of them might be educational groups, some of them might be water and sanitation, nature, indigenous, like. Um, gender rights, LGBTQ, disability rights, but by everyone coming together, that's how we're, we're going to win when we rally together. And I think often we get passionate about our own issues, but when someone comes and asks us for help, are we willing to jump into the, to ring with them and fight alongside them? Because I think when we do that as an advocacy community as, and as advocates and anyone, that's where we're gonna get, get progress and change. The, the, the second point I'd just make is, you know, I, I firmly believe, picking up on what Sabrina said in the power of conversation, how you do that is, is important. You take an issue like climate change. I'm sure we've all got members of the family in America, whether it was those that didn't support the candidates we did, Biden, Trump, here, Brexit, or not Brexit, and climate change, denier, uh, for action on climate change. And when we look at facts and we try and have rational conversations, we mm -hmm. wonder why we don't get anywhere. And that's because a lot of this is rooted in identity. It's rooted in values. It's, it's rooted in, in emotion. And so I always advise people, like when you're having a conversation with someone on these issues, try and think through, okay, what are, what are the values that these people hold dear? 
maybe they're pro-life. Okay, if I'm trying to move them on climate change, how can I anchor this in a conversation that appeals to them? Maybe they're, they're for the truth. Maybe they're for, um, you know, action. Maybe they're for compassion. Maybe they're for um, empathy. Maybe it's something as, as easy as, you know what, I know this person really likes beer, and so I'm going to uh, find a conversation around climate change, linking it to beer or cars or so on or sports. But try and anchor it in values. And, um, you know, I think if we can do that a lot more, that's where we will be able, you take America, that 12% of people who talk about climate change, I think that's how we might be able to get more traction on the issues and maybe find common cause to actually create change. Thank you. And Kendra, do you have one thing? Sure. I think, um, I think when, you, when you think about climate change, sometimes it's easy to become overwhelmed by the scale of the problem uh, and to feel like there's nothing you can do individually. I think it's also, we were talking about this a bit earlier, there, there's a tendency to put pressure on individuals to make changes that I personally think absolves the, great, uh, the, the greater system from being responsible and making the changes that are needed. Um, what I would say to you is if you have a bank account, if you have an investment account, if you have a pension account, if you have a faith community, if you have an organization that you're part of, you are a shareholder in that institution, whether you realize it or not, whether you have one pound or whether you have 10 million pounds in that institution, and you are one voice who can email that institution, who can ask them to not invest in the things that are making the world worse. You can ask, you know, Barclays, for example, you can send an email and say, what are your plans for um, ESG investing or sustainable investing? Have you divested from fossil fuels? You can call on your universities or your faith groups to divest from fossil fuels. My philosophy when it comes to this is, you know, it's important to take individual action if you can. Um, but until we live in a system where there is structural change and, and the people with billions and billions and billions of, of pounds or dollars or whatever currency and, and resources are actually taking action at scale, we have to push for that to happen because it, un, unless that happens, individual action is important and it's great and it makes you feel better, but it's ultimately not scalable uh, in time with what we need to do. So I think don't despair, but use, that, use the power of your own communications infrastructure to email people, to tweet people, uh, to ask them to be responsible and you know that includes your workplaces as well. So don't think that you don't have power because you do. Okay, thank you very much for that. So now it's time to move on to some questions from the audience and we were delighted to receive so many from our guests. Uh, so we'll try to get through as many of them as we can. I think we've got Daisy Malt first. Daisy, would you Hello. like to introduce um, yourself and ask your question? Uh, thank you for such inspiring conversation. It's kind of put a bit more fire in my belly. Um, I work at university in the sustainability team and we do lots of work around engagement. We're quite good at engaging the people who already really switched on to these things. Obviously, we've got a room full of people here, but there's still thousands more across our campus who could be involved. How can we be better, um, I think you've touched on it a bit already, but better at engaging those who might feel like they don't have the power to create change or maybe just don't feel like they want to? So who would like to take that one? Um, <laughs> I mean, the, yeah, I, I think you did touch on it in, but in make it, but I think also, like we said, just it's about creating safe spaces for people to, to talk openly and honestly about what their reservations are, um, what's holding them back. Um, you know, I don't think anyone's ever, I choose to believe no one is inherently bad. I think, you know, everything people go through is a symptom of something. Um, so it's about giving opportunity for people to speak up and to champion their issues and then finding middle ground amongst that, like Mick said. Um, I also think that looking at the problem as one person at a time can actually also help. It helps me for my work that I do is because it, it's easy to feel like a drop in the bucket. Mm -hmm. um, but to be able to have smaller conversations with smaller groups of people as opposed to trying to appeal to everyone at once with a social media post or something, but just to have smaller forums mm -hmm. uh, where people can meet up maybe after class and really express what they're really thinking in, in an area where they're amongst their peers. Maybe they bring their friends initially. I really think engaging people like that is, is, is quite effective. Okay, thank you very much for that. And thank you for the question, Daisy. Uh, Santiago, can we come to you now? Uh, first of all, thank you for your inspiring words. Um, 
uh, later, uh, my question. Uh, so it's, uh, it's well known, it's not a secret that Global South countries are the most vulnerable, one, the most vulnerable ones to global you know, climate crisis. So I'm from Colombia and we don't have the wealth you know, for binding all these uh, uh, international agreements on fighting global crisis. So my question is, uh, should like the biggest carbon emitters, you know, countries or uh, companies, uh, should they just pay a sort of compensation for helping Global South? What do you think? And thanks. Who would like to respond? Um, Mike? Respond. Mike? Uh, I, I mean, I think the answer is yes. And one of the, you know, I'm sitting on the edge because if, if it was one pet um, peeve for me about COP last week is this didn't get enough attention is the debate that, you know, you look at something like COP and it's often presented as, you know, are all countries stepping up to net zero? Um, and is, uh, uh, is it a success or not based on this um, standard? And the problem with that is, is this uh, assumption, and I would say often in the activism community as well, that all countries are starting from the same um, starting line, right? But the reality is, is responsibility shouldn't be shared equally because it's, it's not equal, you know. And you look at the United Kingdom, you look at the US, historically these countries, beginning in the Industrial Revolution, are responsible for a huge amount of emissions. The US alone is responsible for 25% of emissions um, created in, in the history of humanity, full stop, right? And you look at the entire continent of Africa today, and it's responsible for just three to four percent of, of all emissions produced. So the rea reality is, is, is the responsibility isn't equal, and it's unfair to expect countries to all come together and commit to the same standard, especially when commitments to support them have not been met and fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And there was this promise made back in 2009 in Copenhagen that developed countries would give $100 billion annually in climate financing to support the poorest countries. Reality is, is that hasn't been met, and it won't be met at the moment until 2023. And then uh, we'll see where the final text ends up later this week, but there's not even a discussion as yet or a commitment to make up any shortfalls. So all of the years of US inaction under former President Trump, nothing would be said, they'd just be let off the hook. And the reality is, is 100 billion itself is nowhere near enough, right? Mm. That is a fraction of the $700 billion that the US spends on its military day in, day out. And yet, I heard this this morning, the largest consumer of fossil fuels on the planet is the US military, right? So this is something which developed countries can afford. They've got an obligation to afford. And frankly, until we get that, you know, I think it is profoundly unfair to expect those who are hurting and suffering the worst and yet weren't responsible for the climate change we're currently seeing to, to shoulder an equal share of the burden. Like, that, that isn't fair to me. And, and many of them have said last week that until we get that, it's going to be very hard for us to make these commitments. And, and I think where you were going with your question is into this also interesting idea of loss and damages, which is another interesting area around, okay, there's damage we're already receiving from climate change, but let's also be real. There are things or opportunities maybe in the future that will be lost forever, mm -hmm. that will never be regained again as a result of climate change. And in a court of law, you would say, well, okay, what sort of compensation is available to that? And I give full credit to the government of Scotland on day one, okay, it was a million pounds, but by putting loss and damage on the agenda and saying this is something we need to have a credible and legitimate conversation, and I expect this to pick up steam because we've got to be careful in the race to net zero that we don't enforce some sort of new ecological colonialism or, or, or impose a straitjacket that in effect says, hey, look, I'm sorry for all of your citizens still living in poverty, but we've used the carbon budget for the planet and you're just going to have to sit there and 
you know, wait, basically. That, that's not fair and it shouldn't be allowed. And just really quickly, I mean, given that this is a university, uh, we'll give it a, a something to read later if you're, if you're interested in this topic. There's an incredible piece uh, that recently came out in New York Magazine by David Wallace Wells, who wrote An Uninhabitable Earth, which I highly recommend. It's an incredibly mm -hmm. terrifying read, but really important. Um, called Climate Reparations Now, uh, and it's a really, really good article. And he made a point in this piece that not something like 90%, if I'm not um, incorrect, of, of global emissions have been emitted since the birth of the current United States president. I think we often think about this as a problem for, you know, that is uh, Dickensian England is to blame, right? Or uh, the, the sort of industrial era is, is the, the sort of bogeyman in the corner who, who created this problem. It is within our parents and our grandparents' living memory that the majority of the, of the fossil fuels that have been emitted have been put out. So, you know, that is both terrifying, but it's also a moment of accountability for, it's not something that, that happened in some bygone era. It's the majority of them have happened within our lifetimes even. Um, so I think that, that both kind of gives a sense of the scale of the problem, but it also shows that if we've put out that many in those few years, we also can collectively help be part of that solution. We just have to have the political will to do that. Okay, I think we've got about a minute or two left, so I'm gonna just come to one more question. Uh, and can I come to Devon? Hi, um, thank you all for your discussion. Um, I just wanted to know, um, how do you deal with eco-anxiety and do you think that we should harness these feelings to instigate action? Ah. Um, I don't think, I, I'm fearful of looking at it from a perspective of harnessing it because I think it's, it's a real form of, form of anxiety and can be quite detrimental to someone's mental health. So I don't think we should be supporting an idea of scaring people into action. Um, people are afraid. I, I have friends who won't have children <laughs> because you know they're so afraid. Um, I, I think people are seeing this more and more. I do think that um, we need to start looking at ways to actually support people who are going through these anxieties um, as it's becoming more real and real. Um, they will, I think, through education, realize, and not to say that they're not educated, but just having forums and communicating that there are things that we can do I think it's really easy to feel like it's hopeless. I want to say it's not, um, and being able to, you know, spread some of that and help alleviate people's anxieties is is going to be so important in the next coming years. Okay, thank you, Sabrina. Uh, thank you all. It has been such a fascinating discussion. Uh, it uh, it's it's sad to have to bring it to a close, but I know <laughs> that we're we're running out of time, um, and and I know the audience will all agree that it's been an absolute privilege for us to have the opportunity to hear from you today. Uh, we're absolutely delighted to be working with Global Citizen and to sit alongside you, uh, and and to do what we can to to cheer you on and and to learn from the work that you're doing. Um, thank you so much to our Essex graduate kindred for facilitating this event. Uh, and making it happen. We're immensely proud of the work that you're doing uh, and absolutely delighted that you were able to, to join us. Thank you to Michael and to Sabrina for coming to spend time with us today. Um, we appreciate your support. We appreciate your inspiration that you've given us uh, to, to raise awareness of the crucial issues that we face and really urging us on uh, to, to think about how we can be agents for change. So I hope that what you've heard today has inspired you to take action. Uh, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.